I was thinking about what to talk about today, and I realized that um, there are many different stories that uh, have been sort of occupying my mind and have been pursued by various group members, and many of them actually come together in um, in in some of the uh, in in some ways. And I decided that I would rather give you multiple vignettes that are all connected to one another, um, and uh, but it also means that I'm not spending a lot of time and a lot of detail focusing on you know all the aspects of one particular project and computation so i realized that some of the things that i'm going to tell you will have more of a flavor of an advertisement but most of these will have an associated publication which i will try to point to as well um, but i hope that i can convey some of the bigger quite bigger picture questions uh, and the things that i want to discuss today on that front are the question of associative memories and models of associative memory in the brain. Um, and in particular, uh, my title is to understand the role of pre-structured states and scaffolds in memory and um, to propose an architecture that permits high capacity associative memory that also exists on a continuum where it's possible to trade off having multiple states in memory and having um, more or less detail for each of those states um, in memory. So this is this is what I want to focus on. And uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, talk about it. So just a historical note, which is that you know when uh, uh, the, the the sort of uh, some of the very influential models and ideas around associative memory in the brain uh, have come from two sources. One is uh, from David Marr, who proposed that we can think about the hippocampus and its particular architecture as a structure for associative memory. At the same time, Hopfield um, proposed, or shortly after Hopfield proposed, of course, a formal model for content addressable associative memory in the brain. And this is a model that's familiar to um, many of you in the audience. And the idea is that if you start with um, a network that has um, uh, if you start with a network um, that uh, of, of n neurons, say over here, that are all uncoupled, they uh, their states exist in this high dimensional state space of so their n neurons. It's an n dimensional state space, uh, but uh, the the state space doesn't have any interesting dynamics in it. If these neurons are uncoupled, of course, if you initialize the system into some state, the the system will just decay to some um, you know resting state that corresponds to the resting state of all the neurons in the network. Um, now, on the other hand, if you can couple the neurons together with um, sufficiently strong connectivity. In the case of Hopfield networks, if the weight matrix that you connect the neurons with has the form of a symmetric um, sum of outer products weight matrix, um, which is given by, for example, if you have some desired patterns that you want to store in the network, you construct the sum of outer products of all of those patterns and write that in as the weight matrix for that network, then those patterns become the stable um, fixed points of the dynamics of that network. And this, of course, in a nutshell, is the idea of Hopfield networks. So here, for example, in green are now um, fixed points of the dynamics of the network, and these states are, um, are, are, are stable. And what this means is that if you initialize the system in one of these states, it will remain in that state. And moreover, if you perturb the system around these states, then um, those perturbations will decay through the network's own dynamics to relax the system back to one of these states. So this is now a system that is a memory system. Um, each of these fixed points um, uh, is, a, is a memory. And moreover, it's robust because of this um, pattern uh, you know, completion or error correction um, dynamics. And um, moreover, the network is content addressable. These memory states are content addressable. You can initialize the system um, with a corrupted version of, of, of one of the patterns that you store in here. So for example, if the memory state is, um, is, is the spider over here, um, we can initialize the system with this uh, corrupted version or partial version of, of, of one of these um, stored in memory states and the, the network auto completes, right? So um, in other words, um, because the memory can be addressed by a fragment of the pattern itself, this is content addressable. And moreover, the pattern um, completion gives it a, a, a measure, a strong measure of robustness. So the question is, you know, is this a model of hippocampus? Is this a reasonable model of memory in the brain? 
All right. So to address this question, then let's uh, let's uh, let's consider some of the theoretical uh, results around Hopfield networks. So one of the issues with uh, Hopfield networks as a model for memory in the brain is that um, it's it's simultaneously too um, able and 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 too um, non able. Okay. And let me try to unpack that. So um, the problem with these Hopfield networks um, as a model for memory in the brain is that in general. Uh, they accommodate relatively few patterns. And if you try to accommodate more patterns into the network, um, there is a catastrophic failure. So, okay, so if there are n neurons in the network, the number of patterns that can be stored is only of order n. So it's 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 just linear in the number of neurons. Um, and um, each pattern, though, can be really rich in detail. So we can um, Hopfield network store up to n bits per pattern. So you can have user defined patterns that, uh, you know, are random and arbitrary and the network stores um, uh, all the bits in that pattern. Uh, and so uh, even, you know, e including random noise. Right. And we know that that is not something we're very good at. We're not good at storing um, random arbitrary patterns uh, in memory. Uh, so, okay, so that means that we've got simultaneously a small number of patterns that can be stored, but uh, a, a massive amount of information per pattern, right? So this is a system that's simultaneously too capable and not capable enough from a biological perspective. And finally, there's this notion of the memory cliff, which is if you try to pack in beyond a certain point, if you add one more pattern into the system, it actually destroys the memory of all the, the patterns that are in there. Okay, so, um, so right, so these are a few dimensions in which maybe these models are not accurate models of, uh, of memory in biological systems. And the question is, can we build um, alternative uh, models of memory that could serve as um, better models? Okay, so I am trying to advance over here. Uh, and I'm Aha. Uh -huh. So, okay, so one question we can ask, right, I'm actually going to ask two questions in this talk. And so the first question I'm going to ask is, can we relax um, the Hopfield network in such a way that we can go from having very few patterns that are extremely detailed, um, so these are the conventional networks. So, and and by the way, another way to um, um, uh, describe what happens in these Hopfield networks is you can have you can store up to n patterns with n bits per pattern for a total of n squared total bits, which equals to the total number of synapses in the network. Um, so that's where the Hopfield networks are. And you know, is it possible to conserve the same number of total bits in the network but distribute them in quite a different way so that instead we go to the opposite end? There's an opposite part of the spectrum where maybe we can have patterns where we store scarcely enough in any information in the patterns. Okay, so each pattern is sort of um, stores very little information, but there are a large number of them. But again, they're highly robust and, and stable, right? So in other words, can we go to that opposite extreme? And then the other question that I'm going to ask after that, after trying to answer that question is, now, if it's possible to construct networks at these two ends of the spectrum, few patterns very detailed, very little detail, many patterns, can we actually construct an associative memory continuum that allows you to trade off between pattern richness and pattern number? So the first thing then that I'll uh, tell you about is work with Rishidev Chaudhry, who is now a faculty member in um, UC Davis, and he uh, uh, was in my group as a postdoc. And Rishi is a wonderful person and um, a wonderful scientist. And uh, together we had a lot of fun thinking about this question of, you know, is it possible to build networks? Can we build in a network, uh, a Hopfield network, which has a very large number of fixed points and more where the fixed points are all robust? So one thing I should say for all of you physicists in the audience is that the answer is yes, of course, you can build a, a Hopfield like network with a very large number of fixed points if you don't control what those fixed points are by simply choosing the network to be a random network. So it's it's known that you know random networks, also known as spin glasses um, with Hopfield like dynamics, have a, a large number of fixed points, right? Exponentially many as a function of the number of neurons in the circuit. But the problem with that is that those fixed points are not all robust. They don't have large basins. Um, and so the question that I'm asking is, is it possible to get a large number of fixed points and simultaneously have large basins, or in other words, have robustness, so that each of those fixed points um, can be you know, corrected and retrieved um, even in the presence of noise? 
So here's our inspiration. So the, the, the inspiration for whether this could even be possible um, comes from you know, the theory of error correcting code. So here is an example of a, a, a very you know, well-known error correcting code, the Hamming, this family of Hamming codes. And here, let's just talk about a specific uh, element of that Hamming code family, the seven comma four Hamming code, right? So the, the way seven, uh, seven, this Hamming codes work is that you've got some number of bits that are information bits. So here, um, X1 up through X4 are binary um, elements and they uh, convey information and added to them is a set of three extra bits which are called parity check bits or um, you know error correction bits and um, basically these bits are not independent of one another and that's what permits us to do error correction on the bits so um, and and the way this um, non-independence is imposed is by um, three constraint equations so we've got like these three extra bits and they satisfy these three three constraint equations um, which relate um, all the bits to one another so here's your three equations and here's the set of all the um, the 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 Hamming uh, code code words which are uh, you know uh, vectors that satisfy all of these constraint equations so we can with this construction, we can uh, create two to the four coding states, all right, um, using these seven symbols. And these two to the four coding states are states that are separated from one another by um, two bits, two bit flips. And so it means that if they're they're all kind of well separated in this coding space, and so it means that it's possible to correct all one bit errors in the in in the code words uh, by just mapping any one bit error to the closest in Hamming distance um, um, uh, code word, and and it's possible to also signal all two bit errors. So you can detect two bit errors and correct all one bit. Errors. So the point is what we want is we want to achieve this kind of scaling of patterns and the self, you know, and this like robustness of the, of the fixed points, we want to um, uh, um, uh, build them into a network. And we want the network to be able to do its own self-correcting dynamics, right? So unlike in error correcting codes, like in this Hamming code, we're assuming the existence of a downstream decoder that can take any of any vector and then do the nearest neighbor mapping, which is it can find which is the closest coding word corresponding to the received vector and then it does the decoding. What we want is we want to build a neural network that embeds all of these coding words as fixed points of the dynamics and secondly, we want the dynamics of the network, of the Hopfield network, to do that error correction of these one bit errors. OK, so that's what we want to do. And is this possible? So the answer is actually the first part, which is can we construct a, a Hopfield network where we can embed these code words as the minima or the fixed points of the dynamics? That is, is straightforward. So let's um, come up with the construction for that. Um, so here's a, a, a Hopfield network um, uh, of a variety that's not um, the, the standard Hopfield network. This is actually a Hopfield network with higher degree um, connectivity. So here we have taken now um, seven neurons to represent the seven states of the, you know, the seven, seven elements of the vector in the Hamming code. And each one, each neuron can have zero one states. And we're going to now basically uh, set up weights that are fourth order weights that each weight imposes the constraint of one of the constraint equations. So our constraint equations, remember here, um, uh, relate uh, 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 impose relationships between four of the nodes um, or four of the variables um, e each. And so what we're doing is we're just setting up fourth order weights that are basically imposing um, this kind of structure. So in other words, what I will assert then, um, and you can very, um, I think, easily see, is that we can set up uh, this uh, weight matrix where um, uh, we have a, a non-zero edge for for each um, uh, for each um, uh, equation in our constraint equations, and this is the resulting energy function that you get for a corresponding Hopfield network of higher degree. So it's it's basically the energy function is a product of the activations of the four nodes um, uh, that are involved in each of the constraint equations. So this is our energy function, and with this energy function and this um, higher order weight profile, the code words have become the minima of the dynamics of this network under Hopfield updates. Okay, so that was really easy. Um, and uh, now there are two objections you may have. One is that we don't think of, um, uh, you know, in, in biological systems, we typically think about connectivity between neurons as um, being pairwise, um, and, and we don't think of there being higher order weights. Uh, and, and so that's one issue. And then the second question is, well, what about um, the robustness or the, or the basin size of these fixed points? 
Okay, so let's address the first question. So it uh, it turns out that um, in uh, a, a, in a in a network, if you allow there to be hidden units or hidden layer, then it's possible to convert higher order weights into effective pairwise weights through coupling with this hidden um, layer units. And so we introduce now here three different hidden layer units, um, which then um, have um, pairwise weights with all of the visible seven units in the network. So the three hidden units, they make these pairwise weights and um, through the hidden layer are imposing the higher order dependencies um, directly. So that's the way to go from higher order to pairwise weights. Now to the question of the basin size of this construction of these of these minima that are um, fixed points of the dynamics. So um, what we find here is unfortunately disappointing, which is that Hopfield dynamics, even though um, the, the, the code words of the Hamming code are fixed points of the dynamics, unfortunately, the basins are not well behaved. So here is an example where we've got, I'm showing you two fixed points, the, the all ones fixed point, and you can verify that's a fixed point because that minimizes the energy function. And then there's this other fixed point down um, below, which is um, this fixed point uh, where you have minus one, one, minus one, 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 minus one, one. Okay, and so these are these are two adjacent, sort of in the in the Hamming space, two adjacent fixed points of the dynamics of the system. So let's start with the all ones code word, okay? And let's perturb it to um, flip one bit. Let's flip the first bit of the all ones code word. Now, if we were doing um, proper error correction on this received code word with the one bit flipped, it you should just um, look for the closest Hamming distance code word that is the all ones and we should correct back to that and then we'd have error correction that was legitimate or correct. Um, instead, in the Hopfield dynamics, that can happen. So the Hopfield dynamics will actually, starting from the minus one, 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 one code word, can, it will drive you to the all ones um, code word, thereby leading to a uh, proper error correction. But it will also, um, with some probability, lead you actually the opposite way, which is it, it'll flip an additional bit, um, which lowers. And you can see that if you flip the minus one, the first bit, then you've increased energy in the first and the, sorry, in this first and the third uh, terms in this energy function. But if you now um, um, flip the sixth bit, then, um, I'm sorry, if you flip the third bit, then x1 and x3 co-occur in the first and the third terms. So you lowered, lowered the energy of those terms at the expense of increasing the energy of the middle term, but you still have a net lowering of the energy. And so the dynamics can flow the opposite way to the wrong code word. And so, and in fact, Typically, most uh, most times the dynamics will actually flow to the wrong basin because there are many more ways in which you can flip an additional bit and, and lower the energy locally. And so the problem is that Hopfield dynamics exhibit suboptimal decoding, their basins are not correctly engineered, and so you can you will map to the to the further away code word rather than to the closest code word in the Hamming space. This failure shouldn't be surprising because um, you know strong error correcting codes are they're compact um, and they permit error correction, but they require pretty sophisticated decoders to be able to do the kind of correction. So typically they require decoding that looks like belief propagation and other non-biological decoding algorithms. And here we're expecting that a very simple Hopfield-like dynamic should be doing the, uh, the decoding. So what this boils down to ultimately is a problem of uh, credit assignment in the correction process, which is if you flip that first bit, it's not clear to the network that that first bit was the one that's an error, and it attempts to correct the error by flipping some wrong bit. Okay, so it, it cannot correctly identify which bit um, is the wrong bit. So then, um, uh, but okay, so just to cut a, a long story short, um, these naive constructions of Hopfield networks, even with the embellishment of having hidden units, um, it doesn't seem to be able to do the appropriate error correction dynamics um, because of this problem of credit assignment. And I won't have um, time to delve into a lot of the details, but uh, it turns out that from the theory, so this is, um, uh, it turns out that uh, there's a beautiful connection between um, random networks and low density parity check codes. Uh, and, and that work has been, um, uh, uh, you know, this is a body of work by uh, Sipser and Spielman and others who show that um, these expander graphs, which are random sparse graphs, um, in which um, uh, uh, there's, there's an expansion property in the connectivity between uh, the hidden layer units and the, um, the visible layer units. Uh, if, if you have this expansion property in the connectivity, so if these are sparse random connectivity architectures, then it's possible for um, 
these networks to solve this credit assignment problem that we saw in our previous construction of the Hamming network. So in other words, if we construct a network where we've got these input units, um, uh, these, these visible units are sparsely and randomly connected to the, the units in the hidden layers, okay, rather than being densely connected like in the, in the previous construction, then there, this solves the credit assignment problem. And in fact, it's possible to build um, a large number of fixed points into a network um, and have robust large basins so that it's possible to robustly error correct. So what I, uh, I mean to say then is that instead of having the dense connectivity um, seen in this solution over here, um, where basically each hidden node is connected to um, all the visible nodes, right, or, or a large fraction of the visible nodes, um, this denseness leads to this failure of credit assignment, but sparse random graphs actually allow to solve the problem of credit assignment. And if you're interested in the theoretical aspects of the, the computations and the proofs, you can read them over here in this paper by Rishi in Europe's in 2019. But basically the idea is that with the solution to the credit assignment problem, what we can show both theoretically and here numerically, um, um, uh, it's possible to have a number of fixed points in this network that grows exponentially in the number of nodes in the network, both hidden and um, visible nodes combined. Okay, and moreover, um, each of these fixed points is robust because um, uh, the, the network can, 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 can correct up to 10% errors in, in each of the patterns. And so um, this, is, this is just a plot showing for increasing network size, it's possible to get sharper and sharper um, error correction um, curves over here. Okay, so that's, that is now our construction of these network, this network that has a number of robust fixed points with large basins. And so, um, so, so, so that's kind of our interim result. So we've constructed these states, which are well spaced out in the coding space. Uh, and in such a way that the Hopfield, naive Hopfield dynamics can do error correction on those states. Now, the price that we pay with doing that kind of um, uh, construction is that these states are not, unlike the Hopfield network, they're not arbitrary or user-defined states. So they have very little information. They have no information in them. These are pre-structured states that we have built that are defined by that sparse expander connectivity structure between the hidden and the visible nodes. Okay, so that once you specify the weights in the network, then you have also pre-specified the set of fixed points and they're not user defined. So the question then is, is it possible to utilize this kind of scheme in, for, 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 for doing a, a useful computation? So what is the utility of a very large number of pre-structured fixed points with large basins? So one way to think about this is we can think about this dynamics as just doing um, a nearest neighbor search, right? So in other words, given a noisy um, input state, right, uh, it will find you the nearest neighbor um, through the dynamics of the Hopfield network. So one thing that we can do to use this um, network is we can think about each of those fixed points as labels for some user-defined input patterns that we associate with the labels. So here's an example then, um, conceptually again. So this is our, this is our state space with well-separated fixed points, large basins. And what we wanna do is we wanna take user-defined patterns, inputs, and tie them to or associate them with these different fixed points, okay? And so we can do that through feedforward um, learning uh, between um, these, um, these patterns and um, the states in this memory network. Okay, so here in this case, I'm taking Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, mapping them to these two different um, two different fixed points. And then the idea is that now, if I were to present you with uh, with a corrupted version of an image, which is somewhere in between, um, or, or or a noisy version of one of these images, in this case, it's uh, uh, Brangelina, uh, then uh, it should automatically um, uh, find the nearest label uh, that 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 matches um, that uh, that corrupted pattern. So that's the hope. And so the way to construct this is to do um, the following. So we have now in our box over here, I'm showing you, these These are actually our, our nodes um, and these nodes have the sparse uh, uh, connectivity structure. So everything uh, with, this, with these visible nodes. So everything in this dash box 
is this memory network construction with large number of um, structured memory states that I just told you about. So the dash box is what we've we've already discussed. And now this um, lower layer is now these high dimensional inputs that are your arbitrary patterns that you want to associate with the fixed structured memory states. Okay, and so this is this can be a very large number of patterns and they can be um, dense, um, high dimensional patterns. Uh, whereas, um, so we can have inputs that are as big as m different um, of order m uh, size vectors as the inputs and the memory network uh, because uh, can be as small as size log m okay so in other words the memory network can be much much smaller than the length of the patterns that are being um, that are being associated with the states in the memory network okay and so and we can construct a, a, one, with one shot heavy in learning a map from the fixed points the, the states here that are fixed points and um, patterns that are presented one by one in the inputs. Um, and you can do this in a sequential or online way. And um, the mapping between these external inputs and then this input uh, and, and these um, memory states, uh, you know, they preserve uh, uh, relative distances between the input patterns. Uh, and uh, so therefore, the mapping is content addressable. In, in other words, the mapping from external images or external vectors to these fixed points um, is 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 content addressable because of distance preserving um, nature of the construction and the pattern completion dynamics within the memory network permits uh, cleanup or construction to uh, the, it per permits cleanup so that you can present a noisy version of the input image and it'll retrieve the correct label for that image. Okay, and so just to show you then numerically the results, we can um, we can uh, uh, take the network um, present it with. Uh, a bunch of images that we associate through this feedforward heavy and learning um, uh, um, with the states in this memory network, and then we can present um, corrupted versions of these, um, you know, learned patterns, and um, and then look at the retrieval uh, uh, whether or not it's correct. And so we can look at um, the the probability of a correct retrieval of labels, and we find that. Um, it's possible even up to something like 24% um, input corruption. It's possible with pseudo inverse learning to um, to um, to correct those kinds of errors and retrieve the right label for the given input. So this is like a label retrieval. So it's like nearest neighbor search. We're not actually retrieving the whole pattern, right? That was the you, you know given an input pattern or corrupted version of an input pattern. This retrieves the correct label. It doesn't retrieve the pattern itself. Okay, so this is a, a labeling network, or you can think about it as performing um, a, a high dimensional nearest neighbor search, um, and or you can think about it as a hash, a robust hash um, uh, memory. The other thing that you can do with this uh, network is uh, a robust familiarity detection or novelty detection. So if this network has been trained, again, this is the memory part of the network with a structured um, a large number of fixed points, and these, this is the external vector that's being associated to those fixed points, then those, uh, those, states, uh, that, uh, uh, those states that are fixed points are low energy states of the dynamics. And in our construction, these low energy states also correspond to low activity states of the network. So um, by the construction, and, and, the, and the reason that's true is because the hidden nodes in our memory network correspond to local small winner take all circuits. And so if the, uh, uh, we're in a state uh, which corresponds to a stable fixed point of the dynamics, there'll be only one neuron active in each of these constraint nodes, and all the other neurons will be silenced because of the winner-take-all dynamics. Um, and this will be true in each of the hidden nodes. Whereas if the state that the network is in is not a stable fixed point of the network's dynamics, then these individual winner-take-all networks will not have settled to, uh, to a you know, winner-take-all state. There'll be multiple active neurons in each of these winner-take-all networks. And so that corresponds to a, a you know, higher activation total in the network. Okay, so in other words, if the network has flowed successfully to, to an actual um, uh, fixed point that's been uh, stored in the network, then, um, then you get low activation. And if the network is in turn being driven by an input that has been not been mapped to uh, a fixed point of the network's dynamics, that input is driving the network to be in a different state, not a low energy state and not a low activity state. And so by simply summing the total activations in the network, we can make a decision about whether the input that's driving the network is a familiar input, in which case 
there will be less activity in the network overall, or if it's a novel input, in which case that, that input is driving the network to a non-fixed point um, and there will be higher activity in the network. So by simply reading out the activity level in the network, it, this network can make a robust um, familiarity or novelty detection um, decision. So um, what I'm showing you over here is that um, there's a there's a there's a there's a significant difference between the activation level in the network for novel states versus familiar states, and um, there's a big difference in the energy of the novel versus familiar states. Uh, but actually, you know, the different novel states and the different familiar states actually are, are very similar to one another statistically in the input states. So it's not like the, the, the inputs themselves are statistically different from one another. It's just that they haven't been mapped to these low energy states when they're novel and they have been when they're familiar. Okay, so basically that's it. So this is um, uh, another, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a mechanism for novelty detection. That's a distinct mechanism than things like adaptation, which are other mechanisms that people have proposed for performing novelty detection in neural circuits. And the point is that because of the very large capacity of this network, it's possible to imagine using a relatively small network to um, learn um, things over a lifetime and, um, you know, and then do novelty detection or familiarity detection on items in an online streaming setting as we encounter and learn things uh, without encountering the memory cliff where you fall off, right? So that is the point of having these, you know, exponential capacity networks that can do label retrieval and, and novelty detection. Okay, so let's just summarize where we are. So right now what we've seen is a hop fill network gives you few patterns, but with rich detail. On the other hand, we can construct um, pattern networks that have exponentially large capacity, again, with hop field like dynamics, um, but each pattern has very little detail. Nevertheless, you can use the patterns for doing things like um, uh, 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 familiarity detection and label retrieval, though not pattern reconstruction. Okay, so, so we kind of have now populated two opposite ends of this memory spectrum where um, we're taking n squared bits, storing n squared bits, and either using them for you know, large numbers of patterns or large information per pattern. So then that brings me to that second question that I said I'd like to ask and address here, which is, is it possible to now define a memory continuum? So is it possible to um, be able to construct um, a network, a single network that, okay, so so on the left here, what I'm showing you is I'm showing you on this, um, I'm showing you this memory frontier where we've got sort of total mutual information recovered. This is mutual information recovered per pattern. So this is like how much pattern information is stored in the network. And on the x-axis, so y-axis is information per pattern, x-axis is number of patterns. And what we see here is this dash line that defines the line n squared, which is, you know, um, the, the, the product of information per pattern times number of patterns should be is n squared at most in a network with n squared synapses, right? So, um, of course, the conventional Hopfield network is on one end of this, and the network that I just showed you is um, here on this other end of it. And now the question is, um, you know, and of course, if you have a Hopfield network that's sparse, you can construct you know, a, a, a network that's sort of somewhere in the middle of that of that line. But again, it's a single network that, uh, you know, for a certain level of sparseness can do that value, right? There's no network that's sort of self interpolating um, that, you know, as you pack in more patterns, it's automatically going from more recall per pattern, more <laughs> richness per pattern to less richness per pattern, right? So what we want to do is we want to ask the question whether it's possible to construct a network that a single network that can automatically move along that frontier um, of, of, of memory and, um, and, and, and just, just trade off number of patterns for um, richness. All right, so, so to answer this question, I want to point out that this network that uh, we've been discussing actually is reminiscent of, and this brings me back to the, the, the introduction, um, is reminiscent of the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is something I've been you know, thinking a fair amount about lately. Um, and before that, I thought a fair amount about uh, grid cells. And so uh, uh, the connections uh, here are, are the following between the network we were looking at 
and the hippocampal network. So let me try to make um, some analogies. So we talked about um, a, a bipartite network as our structured memory network in, in, in the previous part, right? And in that structured um, bipartite network, we had visible neurons, um, these lower ones, and we had these constraint neurons, these upper ones. And the constraint neurons were imposing uh, relationships uh, in the states of the visible neurons. Okay, and so uh, they, they, their job is to impose structure or constraints. And so we can think about these constraint nodes or constraint neurons as um, grid cells in the uh, cortical hippocampal memory system, because grid cells, like I'll try to make the case to you next time in the next slides, is that uh, are, are highly structured um, uh, uh, cells that maintain um, very, uh, very, they have very, very highly structured states. And uh, I'd like to equate the visible uh, nodes in our memory network with, uh, with, with place cells, okay? So grid cells are our hidden nodes, place cells are our visible nodes in the memory network, and then the external inputs that um, we would try to associate with those, um, with those um, states uh, reside in neocortex. So in other words, these high dimensional vectors um, that are of length n compared to the log m states in our memory network, these are neocortical states um, uh, uh, and they become associated with this, uh, with this architecture in the hippocampal entorhinal cortex circuit. Okay so, okay, so within this framework then, so I'd like to give this interpretation and then I'd like to make the case for why this is um, maybe a plausible interpretation of grid cells and place cells. And then at the end, I'll come back to the construction of this continuum memory network using this architecture as our inspiration. So, um, okay, so, uh, so, so this, is, this is the argument, is that place cells are highly constrained by um, grid cells. Grid cells provide the structured um, scaffold of states and collectively grid and place cells um, generate this large number of stable fixed points that are structured, and then um, neocortical inputs are then associated onto these structured states, right? So that's the conceptual framework here. And here is here it is in a picture. I'm showing you this like picture of, uh, of, of, of a physical scaffold, like this, um, this, uh, this grid, this metal grid, on which we are just taking memories, um, pictures, you know, flowers, other images, and just attaching them to different parts of the scaffold, right? So the idea being that as we go through the world, we accumulate, you know, um, we have encounters with cues and objects and events and episodes, and we are somehow decorating that scaffold with those objects. It's like hooking on decorations onto your Christmas tree, right? So we're really thinking about this memory system as some kind of a pre-structured thing to which we can associate these external um, events. So this is not unreasonable even in, so when we think about um, the hippocampus and the spatial domain, we often think about hippocampus as providing some kind of a spatial map or cognitive map that associates coordinates, internally derived uh, coordinates about, you know, where we are in some Cartesian sense in the world with external cues, like where did those external cues, where were they encountered, right? So we're, we're kind of associating the where with the what. And that is the common conception of what hippocampus does in, 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 the, in the spatial domain. But much more generally, we can, think about an we can think about the hippocampus as an associative memory that is binding external data to an internal scaffold, right? So again, now the external data are like the what, and then the internal scaffold is like in the, in the spatial sense, the where, okay? But again, the internal scaffold in this picture would be provided by grid cells, and the external data would be provided by neocortex. Okay, so now let's talk about some real data um, while we're um, making this analogy with the hippocampal um, entorhinal circuit. So um, this is um, some data analysis work where we've tried to understand whether there is actually evidence. Is it reasonable to say that the place cell system is strongly influenced by these structured um, grid cells and exhibits um, signatures of this kind of scaffolded memory system. Okay, so here is the enigma of place cells as, as, as I currently see it, which is that if you look at this is um, beautiful recordings from Albert Lee's group showing um, the response of a population of place cells um, indexed here on the y-axis against position uh, when animals are moving along very long tracks of about 40 meters or so. 
And what he finds is that when you look at these place cells along these very long tracks, then unlike their name, they start representing not just single places, like they're not representing a place, but they start um, uh, uh, have, displaying many different fields. So a given place cell now fires at multiple different locations along this track. And um, as a population, you know, if you look individually at the place cells, it seems like uh, practically random placement of their fields along the long track. And there is a big distribution in the propensity or the tendency of a place cell to fire across the, the track that's preserved across you know, all track lengths. So basically, let me. What, what do I mean by that? I mean that if you look at one of these place cells, like say cell number 253, and you look at it on the first half of the track and see that it tends to fire uh, fields pretty often. Then if you look in the second half of the track, um, its probability of firing fields is retained. It's the same probability, elevated probability of firing fields relative to the other cells. And there's some cells that basically will fire very little on you know, the first half of the track, and they will continue to fire very little on the second half of the track. So it looks like, and in fact, statistically, the distribution of placed fields on the track is well described by this negative binomial or gamma Poisson distribution, where each cell can be defined as having a base rate of firing fields, emitting fields. But within that, within that, uh, given that, um, the placement of the fields appears to be random and Poisson. Okay, and so um, um, so it is consistent. It seems like the, the the placement is consistent with the random process with the spread of mean rates across cells. And so the questions then are: Does this um, response of cells have an underlying structure that we can um, that we can find and unmask? And how much freedom do cells have in making a choice of where to fire? So um, the first um, statement is, um, why should we expect there to be structure in the place fields? Well, the reason you should expect that there, there might be structure in place fields is because grid cells are an input to place cells. And in fact, grid cells are highly structured. So not to belabor the point, there have been multiple lines of evidence showing that um, the dynamics of grid cells um, are, are, are highly constrained. And in fact, if you look at um, uh, but the theoretical models predict that um, the, the the set of states or the state space of uh, an entire module of grid cells, so um, you know thousands of cells that have a common period, will lie on just the surface of a two-dimensional um, torus. And moreover, the cell-cell relationships, if you measure uh, uh, relationships of pairs of cells across environments, both familiar and novel ones, even though the cells' responses may change across environments, the cell-cell relationships are highly conserved and consistent with lying on the surface of a torus. And more directly, um, very recent um, large population recordings of grid cells show that indeed these models are, 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 are accurate and the states of um, each grid module do seem to be highly constrained. And in fact, the states are also preserved and constrained between um, across uh, sleep and waking. So um, in uh, green, uh, the uh, sorry, the green curve here is the, the pairwise cell-cell correlation structure of neurons pairwise grid cells recorded in, um, in endorama cortex, um, and, um, and, and cells are sorted or arranged according to their pairwise correlation. So these, this, you know, there are cells here that are highly correlated uh, because they have overlapping fields and other cells that are less correlated. And if you look at the same cell pairs in sleeping, so um, orange is REM sleep and purple is non-REM sleep, you find that the pairwise cell-cell relationships are preserved um, in waking and sleep. So this suggests that really these dynamics of place cells are highly structured across and internally generated. And this is not true for the hippocampal place cells. Um, um, in, 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 the, the structures that you see in waking are not preserved during sleep. Okay, so, so there is a highly structured input that comes into place cells, and so now we want to understand both theoretically and experimentally the evidence that place cells are um, structured. Okay, so uh, the first thing is uh, uh, then in, in that direction is to try to build a model for how place cell responses could be generated and try to um, understand uh, what structures they might exhibit within those models. So um, the question here is, you know, is it possible for a place cell to have fields at arbitrary locations. Okay, so another way to ask this question is, if a place cell has a field, a place field, um, you know, like for example, this pattern of place fields for this one cell. So here's a track, say, and here are some of the fields that the cell has exhibited. Can 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 I can I like extend if I extend the track, can 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 I uh you know I mean can is there any constraint on where the fields are gonna fall on the remaining part of the track? 
given the fields where, you know, given the locations of the fields in the previous part of the track, or, or is there actually a relationship? Are, are, are the positions constrained? Right. Or uh, another way to ask this question is, can I ask a place field, can I induce a field at some arbitrary location of my choosing? And then can the cell actually express a field at that location, even in the absence of external sensory cues? And so that's what I call a mnemonic field. These are fields that the cell can express even in the absence of an external cue that drives it at that location. Right. So the question is about placement of mnemonic fields. So here's a simple model to try to understand that um, in, in the case where, um, you know, the, the, under the assumption that the mnemonic fields are all grid cell driven fields. OK, so the idea is that place fields are constructing a conjunction between sensory driven inputs and internally generated states through grid cells. And so what we want to understand is what are the constraints on place field firing? if the only inputs were just grid cell inputs, because these would be the ones that are driving mnemonic fields. So given that the inputs are structured and periodic, how many constraints does that place on the configuration of place fields expressed by a single cell? So here's a really simple model for place cells. They're just a place cell is just a single cell is just a perceptron that is summing inputs from a bunch of different grid cells with different phases and different periods. Okay, that's the idea. And all a place cell does is sum those inputs and applies a threshold and uh, any parts of the inputs above threshold now define a place field. So here are two, two place fields over here. And um, there's a discretized version that we could define of this where we just discretize space and have the grid cells have periodic activity within that discrete space. And, um, and then again, we just do the same uh, perceptron computation and define fields. And so let's try to understand two properties of this um, of the resulting place field. So the question is, what is the repertoire of field arrangements that is achievable? So how many distinct field arrangements can a place cell achieve um, uh, with uh, given these grid cell inputs or the full range in which that set of grid cell inputs is unique, right? So I can I can unroll you know the grid cell code uh, over space. And um, at some point, the grid cell codes will repeat because they're periodic collectively. But um, because each of them has different periods, there's a big distance over which the grid codes don't repeat. And I want to ask, how many distinct field arrangements can a place field realize, place cell realize with those inputs? And the capacity question is, what is the spatial distance, contiguous range of positions over which a place cell can achieve any possible field arrangement that I specify? So if I ask a place cell to have a field at positions 1, 3, and 7, right? Uh, and, and user defined positions, what is the range of distances over which I can have user defined field uh, arrangements for a place cell? Okay, so those are the questions I ask. And let me just outline the way that we can then attack this problem. So um, the way to um, uh, uh, solve this problem is because this is a simple percept, this is just a perceptron problem, right? Um, we know how to do cal capacity calculations for perceptrons. This is exactly the calculation that we want to do, like Cover and Thomas. But this, the, the complexity here is that now the inputs, instead of being in general position or random position, these are now structured inputs. The inputs are in very specific um, locations in the input space because the grid cell response is periodic, right, and with different periods. So what we need to do is, first of all, we need to understand what is the geometry of these inputs, how are they structured, and then counting is a question of drawing hyperplanes and asking how many different, um, uh, you know, combinations of of, 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 of of how many different dichotomies can I construct in the space. So here is our standard um, uh, uh, perceptron type result. So of course, if we have points in this in this input space, then a, a field uh, arrangement is realizable if the the if I want three fields if I want if, if if I want these three positions to correspond to a place field then if these three positions can be separated from these two positions over here by a hyperplane then that field configuration is realizable and uh, and this field configuration where if I want these two locations to correspond to a place field and these two positions to correspond to a non place field, then I cannot find a threshold to draw for my place cell that can make both of these a field and both of these a non field. 
right? So, so that's the idea here. And so let's let's walk through this. So then we've got um, we've got like our you know our line for location coding, um, uh, and 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 you know as we move through um, these positions uh, here, we then generate these grid cell codes over here. Um, and the grid cell codes um, are these you know different periodic repeating codes. And these grid cell codes have a geometry, okay? And they'll have some geometric configuration um, which correspond to these positions x one up to x you know x one x two x three etc correspond to some uh, coding states in the grid coding space over here and in the case of the grid cell code i'll point out that these states are um, uh, regular and we'll characterize the geometry of those states and then we can then count up how many different hyperplanes we can draw that separate um, fields uh, and non fields so you know this is an example of a hyperplane that's separating x1 and x5 positions to be fields and all the other positions to be non fields so then we arrive at this pattern of field arrangements right so that's that's an, a realizable one okay so what is the geometry of the grid cell inputs the geometry of the grid cell inputs is you know we've got in this case i showed you two grid modules one with period 2 and one with period 3 the period uh, two module is just bouncing between these two states, one zero and zero one, right? So we can think about the states as just being this like line um, and, 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 and you know, two nodes and a line. And the three period module is going between these three states, right? And it's cyclically going between these three states. So the geometry of the states within the, the three period module is just a triangle, right? This, equal, this triangle between those three states. And so actually the total geometry of the set of all the grid cell inputs is actually a cross product. It's a product of both of these um, these elementary um, uh, objects, which is a line and a triangle, and that gives us a triangular prism. Okay, and so the the set of all of the states in the two comma three module um, inputs is a, a regular prism. Okay, so that's what. So basically, each of these individual modules defines a simplex, and then the the combined states across is a product of simplices. Okay, so that's um, that's the geometry of the, the grid inputs. And now, given the geometry, we can then go ahead and do our counting. Now, here are some um, alternative codes um, with structures. And I'm sorry, I'm not able to see my cursor on this on this um, laptop. So okay, here we are. So okay, so I can contrast the grid code um, with um, with um, with some other code. So we could imagine if my inputs were more like grandmother cell inputs, like, like conventional place cell inputs, one hot inputs, where we just have a one, you know, um, the, the input code was just one neuron active um, at every uh, position, then um, the geometry of those inputs is, um, is itself a, a simplex. And in a simplex, all the vertices are in general position, and every uh, field arrangement is realizable. Right. Uh, by by contrast, our grid cell code is like this thing that I call a one hot code, and um, this one hot code has a special triangular prism structure. Um, so these two are are similar. And finally, we have like a code which is like a binary code where um, my inputs are actually just binary um, uh, uh, vectors. And when I have these binary vectors, it turns out that these states lie. Of course, binary vectors lie on the vertices of a hypercube. And the vertices of hypercube, like hypercube, have square faces, and we know that squares are intrinsically not linearly separable objects, right? So hypercubes are maximally not linearly separable. Simplices are maximally linearly separable, and then these um, prisms, these products of simplices, are somewhere in the middle. Okay, so that's so that's what it is, and we can actually now with this insight of what is the structure, the geometry of these inputs, we can actually do um, some counting. And here, Lorenzo Sadun um, and Thibaut Taifumier and Mani Yim, my collaborators, did some beautiful counting work to count um, 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 uh, the, the 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 structure of. Um, the, the number of realizable field arrangements. So, so, and and this is just to say that we can also characterize the geometry of the inputs when we have, you know, a um, larger number of grid modules and when the grid modules have different periods. It's always a product of these simplices. Okay, so long story short, um, uh, I should just say the following, which is that now if we have these inputs that have the structure, which is this multi periodic modular structure, then with just relatively small numbers of neurons, in this case, two lambda neurons. Okay, so suppose I have two modules, each with a period of approximately size lambda, then I can represent the states in each of those modules by lambda neurons each. And so I can have two lambda total neurons uh, over here. So now the number of states that can be realized, the, the, the number of states we can construct in the input. 
um, is because each module increments independently of the other, it's the product of the lambda, so we get order lambda squared different states, right? So, so with two lambda cells and the grid cell input, we can construct lambda squared unique states. Okay, and it turns out then that the number of, we can count and we can construct a number of linear dichotomies or a number of field arrangements that is this number. Okay, so it's actually exponential in lambda um, and with lambda over here. So it's lambda to the two lambda different states. So we can construct a very large number of uh, field arrangements. Now, it turns out, though, that although we can construct a very large number of field arrangements that are realizable, that realizable number of field arrangements is actually a tiny fraction of the total number of field arrangements. OK, so that's one, one of the one of the issues, because, of course, these these products of simplices are not in general position, so a very small fraction are realizable. On the other hand, if we have a binary uh, code in the input, then with just two lambda cells, we can have two to the two lambda patterns in the input that are unique. Right, because two lambda length binary um, vectors can code two to the two lambda states. So that's what's going on here. We can have a much larger number of linear dichotomies or realizable field arrangements, but the fraction of realizable to all field arrangements is even tinier. So in other words, the realizable field arrangements is a large number, but it's a very, very special subset of all the possible of all the field arrangements. And here it's a very large number of field arrangements, and it's still a special subset, but not quite as special as for binary codes. And whereas if you have a place cell like or grandmother cell like input coding, you can have very few number of input patterns. And um, so the number of uh, field arrangements you can construct is very small, uh, uh, it, it, it's very small, um, but it's a large fraction. It's a not a very special set. So you can construct any field arrangement over the set of inputs. So, um, so basically, the, the bottom line here is that the grid cell inputs are permitting um, um, a large number, they, they kind of like allow you to have a very large number of place field arrangements that are mnemonic field arrangements, but also those field arrangements are quite a special subset of all potential field arrangements. And so really, that's suggesting that what can be uh, realized in place cells, the field arrangements they can exhibit is a very, very special subset of, you know, arbitrary field arrangements. And so we should be able to see the structure that's imposed on the grid cell inputs. So this is also making a point about um, the capacity, and it's the same story here, so I'm going to skip it. Um, and I'm just looking at the time here, David. How many minutes do I have left? One minute left. Okay, great. So um, I won't, okay, so what I'm going to do is um, I'll say that this counting argument um, and, and, and this um, uh, actually leads us to um, ask the following question, which is, can we find, um, can we find, uh, just give me a moment. I'm sorry, I'm not able to skip directly forward because my cursor is not visible on my screen. I want to just ask, I want to just um, present this. Uh, this um, this uh, set of results here in the one minute that I have remaining. So the question is, since the field structure of place cells is then predicted to be a very sub special subset of all possible arrangements, we predict that it, there, there isn't a random, it isn't a random arrangement of fields. And to test this question, we then um, teamed up with Albert Lee's group uh, and Albert Lee and Jason Lee and his group did this series of experiments where um, they trained animals to run in these virtual one-dimensional long tracks of about 40 meters with very few um, external cues um, visible. And so uh, to ensure that the fields are not driven by external spatial cues, so to ensure that the fields that we're recording are mnemonic fields. And um, so they performed this experiment on this track um, and, uh, and, 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 and obtained data from very large numbers of cells, 2,500 place cells in this case. And in this arrangement where Unlike the previous track data I'd shown you, there were lots of external cues available. Here, when there are no external cues available, again, the place field distribution looks um, like a gamma Poisson or a negative binomial distribution. It looks random, but we can then probe deeper and look at the power spectral density of these place cells and average the power spectral density of each place cell and sum across all the different place cells together to unmask any periodic structure that comes into these different um, um, place cells. And what we find here is we find that when we look across um, all the place cells, so we're summing the power spectral density of all the place cells across all the laps, uh, we find that there are just a few notable peaks 
that are prominent, significant, and consistent, three different measures of, uh, of the relevance and um, uh, of these peaks. And these peaks are consistent across laps um, uh, in the run. And these peaks are also consistent across disjoint partitions of, uh, of cells, of place cells. So we can take our set of 2,500 place cells, partition them into four um, uh, uh, disjoint subsets, and we find the same peaks over and over again in all of the different place cells um, in an animal, showing that um, basically there are some prominent features in the parvospectral density. And moreover, these features happen to be at the periods that are um, within the range of 30 centimeters to 200 centimeters. And um, the distribution of these peaks is significantly diff different from the distribution of um, uh, peaks that you might expect in just um, shuffle data, um, suggesting that the peaks that we're finding are really consistent with a signature of an underlying grid cell scaffold. Okay, so uh, so these are, this is the evidence that it's possible to build, um, uh, that, that it's possible that uh, the place cell network in conjunction with grid cells is setting up this like very constrained set of structured patterns with large basins that can be used for an associative memory continuum. And the, and the final piece of the work um, that I just wanna mention is we can now build a network that looks just like the memory network that I told you about, except that now our um, hidden layer states are grid cells, our visible layer states in the memory network are place cells, and then the external inputs are neocortical inputs, which we'll call sensory cells. And by doing this, um, the, my final result here is um, uh, work from Suganda Sharma and Sarthak Chandra in the lab showing that it's possible now with um, this construction uh, to recall, not just recall labels of input patterns, but actually reconstruct patterns um, that are provided like these neocortical inputs. So we can have an arbitrary input pattern memory um, in this network. And as long as the number of patterns that's presented is smaller than the number of place cells, which is in this case about 400, it, you get perfect recall of the patterns, just like a conventional hop fill network. But as you push in more and more patterns into the network over here, so this is more patterns than the number of cells, then um, the memory smoothly decays, the, uh, the, the content uh, of, of recall smoothly decays um, across um, the number of patterns, unlike conventional hop fill networks, which show a catastrophic cliff, memory cliff over here. So that's the end. And so thank you so much for your attention. So um, uh, in the end, we've demonstrated that it is possible using hippocampal um, uh, 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 cortical um, uh, inspired um, architectures to build an associative memory continuum. So thanks once again for your attention. And here are my collaborators and, um, and, and wonderful students and postdocs who've done uh, the bulk of this work.